reactions to uh, um, an idea that might work or not, depending on on uh, on what I what we explore together. What would you think if, let's take the example of K to twelve, and we have student dropouts because of the lack of fitting into a box, right? A, sticking to no to, to grades to systems that are extremely uh, solid but in the way we've seen it right uh, compared to focusing more on on traditional education rather than on innovation and we see many kids who are dropping out of schools and some kids that are having to do their years again and it's interesting to see maybe a solution for those kids that are more on the human side, as you were mentioning it, uh, it before, David, and, and maybe more on the entrepreneurial side, as you were talking about, Claudia, and thinking, what about those kids who just would not be accepted directly into a university because they are uh, school dropouts, right? But they actually acquire some skills, like resilience, like um, some different skills that are not the typical school skills like math, et cetera, et cetera. But I personally, I'm, I'm seeing it with some of my friends actually who maybe didn't finish school with me, but they, many of them today are entrepreneurs. And it's kind of interesting to see that some way, somehow, these people are finding another path because they didn't fit in exactly in the traditional education, but that doesn't mean they don't fit in life, right? And I think it's interesting for us to start thinking and exploring those ideas of ditching maybe those traditional standards to have a, a wider access to education and to what they will become tomorrow. You're talking about self-determination. This can certainly be the path if we actually are able to integrate this. And my question to you is this is just, is this just an illusion from my end or would you think something like that could uh, possibly be uh, part of our future? Okay, um, I see your mind, Alejandra, <laughs> the trend, and I believe it's going to happen. Not at the same speed in every corner of the world. Uh, I would see that there are certain educational systems that are more open and progressive in a way, so they will be open to do these changes. Um, and Latin America, as you know, Ale, it, we're still more in the traditional side. Um, both, I would say the systems and the, the students and the parents, right? So it's on this both sides. So you're going to offer me something so new and then people will be like, maybe it's not for me, show me some results first and maybe I'll do it. So it will all depend and as we know now, the demand on free courses or maybe a free not only in intuition, but also that you can take as, as just independent studies just to add up knowledge of what something, a skill that you need to work on, that is going to continue and has continuously grown a lot in 2020, 2021 will be the same. People do not want as much degrees. They want the knowledge they need in order to function. And maybe, yes, I'm a super duper in all that's referring to Microsoft Office, let's say, but I need like a certification. Maybe I do one of those courses there at LinkedIn. And with that, it will be enough to just have a proof if the employer asks for that. So in the new disruptive business models that will occur in the next five, 10 years, I am sure also that the demands on the profiles regarding education will be changing at the same time. Yeah. I've got a no, question for you, David, yeah. Sorry, David, carry on. <laughs> I was just going to say I really wholeheartedly agree with everything that Claudia just said, and I really appreciate the question of um, what's the value of a credential today? What are the the values of the credentialing institutions, and are they necessary? Um, it's an open question. Uh, we're in a very kind of ambiguous moment where we're all, as I said, re-examining, and the temptation in an open moment is to uh, snap back to the things that give us um, certainty. And so I think we're going to see a motion from some institutions to uh, double down on very uh, tightly defined 
compliance-based attitudes, um, more standards, more qualifications, more seat time, you know, more test scores, because we need to, you know, divide things up into smaller and smaller micro-credentials so we can stack them and people can be portable and move through the economic system. But some people are saying, maybe I don't want to move through the economic system. Maybe I want to create my own entrepreneurial value and have an impact. And so what are those you know, individuals doing? What choices are they making? And are they finding a resonance in their communities where they can actually uh, apply themselves? And I think the answer is increasingly yes. Uh, the nonprofit umbrella is a place where a lot of these people can find homes. You know, uh, we even see more social responsibility in the in the financial worlds around uh, investment practices and seeing that sort of value around um, much more than the, the traditional technical practices. So uh, the parallel, I think, in K-12 instruction is, Alejandra, to, to answer your question, is this just like a pipe dream? So, so what do you do um, if you put aside the technical uh, and traditional academic requirements for a minute. What do you fill that space with? Are you gonna do more of it, um, but just digitize it? Is that the solution? Or are you gonna allow um, some room for, for student voice to come through? And there's this trust activity. So our premise with Lyft Learning uh, and our experience in the classroom before we founded this company is that if you can just hold back and let that self-determination, self-awareness, um, confidence, purpose come through, that learner will be able to achieve as high or higher on the standard measurements as anybody else. They will be able to learn the technical skills when they're ready and when they have a reason to that will allow them to excel in their field. So early, we just want to let them explore, learn, build confidence, and trust that they're going to be able to succeed. But there's anxiety in that moment. If you're a principal or a teacher, and you go, are they really learning? Are they really mastering anything? Oh no, can I really just allow them to explore like this and fail and you know try again? And that's a personal choice we all have to make. If, we, if our, the next generation of educators can learn to be a little more patient um, with delivering on you know, the, the traditional curriculum and time-based kind of approaches, I think people will be pleasantly surprised what these kids will be able to do. That's fascinating the way you're putting it. I'm finding myself agreeing with everything you're saying and, and I'm unable to hide it um, <laughs> in the interest of objectivity. I'm completely in agreement. And it's just, um, it's almost <laughs> to me like there's, a, there's an anxiety about letting go of control. And the argument has always been from higher education has always been, we need to, it's, it's accreditation, we need to have an agreed upon set of standards. And the old argument was for industry, you know, um, but then industry is now saying, well, we don't need it. Actually, we're quite happy with people being entrepreneurial or entrepreneurial and innovative within our companies. Um, so that argument kind of disappeared. In fact, it disappeared quite a while ago. Um, and, and it's interesting as well, what you said about, um, you know, we're going to just do the same thing, but digitize it because that kind of thing is always technology masquerading as progress. And what you're actually doing is just replicating old models, but putting them in apps and online. It's like, it's, nothing's actually changing.